Friends, thank you for uh, joining me uh, on the study of God's Word uh, today. This uh, is the first of a series of sermons on the book of Revelation. I first preached this message in Molesworth at an evening service early in March, and then we came into the time of lockdown and the series was abandoned. I've now resumed that series in our online morning services. We had the first of those on uh, last Sunday, and then the series will continue each Sunday morning. But I wanted to provide for those who weren't at that evening service the first of the series. And so we're going to read together now from the book of Revelation chapter 1. This is the word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who was and who is to is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to God, his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes on earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the of Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it, to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. We end there at verse 11, knowing God will bless the reading of his precious word. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you have given for all time your infallible word in Holy Scripture, a word that we believe spoke to the hearts of men and women long ago and has spoken in every generation, and even today will speak to us. So may we hear with ears that are open to your truth, and believe and receive the word with minds and hearts that are ready to respond to the glory and to the praise of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation what comes to mind when you hear those words? I guess that for some, the first word that comes to mind is difficult. Maybe so difficult that you seldom go there. Perhaps you have labored through reading the book because you wanted to finish a reading through of the whole of the Bible. But if truth be told, you, le you were left all a bit puzzled by what you read. On the other hand, some of you may have been to what has been billed as a series of Bible prophecy meetings, maybe in another church. And there you've been amazed at the things that were right there in the book of Revelation that you had never even noticed. Maybe you've even wondered, why have the Presbyterians never preached sermons like that? Were they not up for it? Have they missed something? Well, if either of 
those two reactions were yours, then you will probably have plenty of good company. The African-American preacher Vodi Baucom suggests that there are three common approaches to the book of Revelation, each of which actually will fail to do it justice. The first of those approaches is fear. And that's the notion, of course, that the book is too difficult and too daunting, even too scary in parts. So it's not something you really want to get involved with. The second approach, Baucom says, is marginalisation, which again presumes that the book, because of its complexity, is mostly of little practical use. So we just set it aside. Of course, there are bits that uh, we think may be of use. Uh, for example, the letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, also right at the end, the, the vision of God's new heaven and new earth. We're familiar with those passages, perhaps. But in between are all those visions that the book of Revelation contains, and we presume them to be too confusing to be of any use. So a big part of the book, for some people, just gets ignored. The third approach, however, swings in the opposite direction. And that is in the direction of sensationalism. That's the approach that you sometimes find in those Bible prophecy meetings that you've heard about, where bold assertions are made that things unfolding in the current day's news bulletins are actually foretold in detail in the book of Revelation. And somehow it always seems possible to tie the two together, even though events change so radically from one decade to another. Allow me to explain what I mean. Back in the days, for example, of the Second World War, some then might have wanted to identify Adolf Hitler with the person of the beast in Revelation, the figure of Antichrist. However, of course, we know the war ended and Hitler died. And then in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the big thing in world news was the Cold War and the continual threat posed by Soviet Russia or Communist China. And again, some preachers saw all of that in the book of Revelation. Again, in due course, the great empire of the Soviet Eastern Bloc came to nothing in and around 1990. And the emerging threat then to world peace appeared to move to the Middle East. And you had the First and Second Gulf Wars. You had the 9-11 attacks on the United States and other terrorist events across the globe. Once again, some preachers were saying, there it is, it's foretold in Revelation. Let me show you the verse. Now I expect probably today uh, someone will have spotted coronavirus in the book of Revelation. That will probably be the next sensational discovery. Now let me say this to be fair. There is no doubt that the many great upheavals of world history, whether in terms of natural disasters or disease, or epidemic, or war, or economic turmoil, those things definitely do find reference in Revelation. And we will come to them in due course. But the kind of sensationalism that's always trying to pinpoint the next big news item in the book of Revelation often serves to distract us from the real purpose of the book, and I think the real benefit of this book for Christians today. So what is this book about? And in what way is it a book relevant and meaningful to the day and age that we live in? That's really what I want us to think about today uh, as we go not much further than the first three verses of chapter 1. And the very first thing we can say here as we read the opening verse is that Revelation is about Jesus Christ. 
the first sentence of verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So whatever else the book of Revelation is about, it is about Jesus Christ, God's Son. Of course, yes, it is also about God's people. It is also about the enemies of God who oppose God's people and who oppose the, the gospel of God's Son. It's also about the unfolding of history towards a great final climax and day of judgment. But in the first instance, it is about Jesus Christ. And that's certainly where the focus is found in this chapter 1, as we would see, God willing, in the subsequent two studies. But some have said that if you wanted to summarise the message of the book of Revelation in just three words, you could do so as follows. Jesus Christ wins. Because that is the outcome of everything at the end of the ages and indeed at the end of this book. So we should see at the outset that the book of Revelation is not a book intended to frighten us or to leave us puzzled and just scratching our heads. It's a book intended to fill God's people with hope, the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, to help our understanding of this book, there are a few other things we should note. The first of these follows on from what I've just been saying, in that Revelation is a letter to real churches. Now, there are a few different schools of interpretation of this book. Probably the one we are most familiar with is the view that Revelation is mainly about events that are to take place in the future, particularly in relation to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, his second coming. And so a lot of what is spoken of in Revelation in that view gets assigned right away into the future to the days just prior to Christ's return. Whenever, of course, that might be, because we don't know the day or the hour when Christ would return. But people who hold that view are those who are often looking closely at current affairs, at present day world events, and they're wondering, has this been fulfilled? Has that been fulfilled? And if so, is Jesus about to return very soon? By complete contrast, there is another school of interpretation, which is not very popular these days, that suggests the, the opposite. That almost everything spoken of in Revelation has already been fulfilled. That its visions and its prophecies speak about events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem, uh, to the Romans and the destruction of the temple in the year AD 70. Now, I won't bore you by going into the detail of how they come to that conclusion except to say that if we go down that road we are left with a book that from which we, we might perhaps want to draw some lessons but which seems not to have much long-term relevance for Christians today. However if we take the other view, the, the futurist view, we're also left with a book that anticipates future events and has us wondering and has us speculating as to when they will happen, but which doesn't say a lot to us in the here and now. So I'm saying that the better approach to take is one that says this is a book that was relevant to Christians living at the end of the first century AD and a book that will continue to speak with relevance to Christians and to the Christian church in every generation until the Lord Jesus returns and all of time comes to an end. Now that it was a book written in the first instance for Christians in the Apostle John's own day, that should be obvious. 
We're told in verse 1 that uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ was made known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. But to whom did John bear witness? The answer is given in verses 4 and 5. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, we look at the details of that in our second study, but for now, we should notice that John addresses this message in the form of a letter that is being sent in the first instance to real churches that existed at that time in what was known as the province of Asia. Today we look upon Asia as a great continent, but then Asia was a province in what would be modern day Western Turkey. And the locations of those seven churches are given in chapters two and three. Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Leo, uh, Philadelphia and Laodicea. In those two chapters, the Lord has particular words of challenge and encouragement for each individual church in turn. But at the same time, the rest of the book is also given to all of the seven churches. And it's not just to given to provide them with some insights into the future, but actually to help them survive and prosper and carry out their mission in the present, which was in those days no small challenge. The year of writing is reckoned to be around 95 AD, when the Apostle John is quite an old man, is living in exile on the island of Patmos. And John has this in common with those to whom he writes. He is suffering for his faith. That's why he's in exile. As he later says in verse 9, I, John, your brother and your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus I was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John had suffered for his faith. He'd been exiled for his faith. But the word God gave him was to help others who were beginning to suffer for their faith under the regime of the Roman Emperor Domitian. However, the ongoing reality for God's people would be that in every generation there would be suffering for the sake of the gospel. And what John would pass on to those seven churches of Asia would stand as God's timeless word to help and encourage suffering and struggling Christians in every age and every generation. It would help them get their suffering and their faith into proper perspective. It would help them endure with faithfulness in the knowledge that ultimately there was total victory in Jesus. So Revelation was a letter written to real churches then and for real churches now. However, there's something else we have to grasp if we're to understand the book of Revelation and to use it profitably. It's this, that Revelation is a particular type of biblical literature. Now I did say a moment ago that it was delivered in the form of a letter, which is absolutely true. However, when you compare it with other New Testament letters written by the likes of Paul and Peter and James and indeed John himself, you soon realise it's not quite the same. The other New Testament letters seem to be written in what one would describe as, I suppose, plain English. <laughs> yes, they, they, they may need a, a bit of careful study in, in order to unearth all the full significance of their message, but on the whole, 
you could read any one of them and fairly easily get a gist of what they're saying. It's not so straightforward with the visions and the symbolism that make up a good part of Revelation. And that's because Revelation represents a particular type of biblical literature which we call apocalyptic literature. The name comes actually from the first word of the book of Revelation, the Greek word apocalypsis. In English, you will be familiar perhaps with the word apocalypse. And whilst our English word apocalypse tends to for, uh, convey the idea of some foreboding, terrible, drastic end time event. Uh, some of you remember a, a, a film years ago about the horrors of the Vietnam War. It was called Apocalypse Now. It's that kind of idea we get in the way we use the word today. But apocalypse simply means an unveiling of something that has been hidden. Hence a revelation. Or if you want an illustration of this, uh, think of, of some company that has designed a new prototype sports car. They've been developing it at a, at a secret facility, uh, but then comes the day when they have notified all of the international press, they're going to have a great launch event, and all the photographers are there, and all the, the reporters are there, and there comes that point where the chief executive of the company makes a, a little speech, and then he pulls a, a huge white sheet uh, from off of this vehicle, and in below is this beautiful, shiny, new sports car that before had been hidden, but now is revealed, and, and the photographers start snapping their cameras and getting the first pictures of the, the new model. And that's the idea of this word, apocalypsis. But in this case, the idea is that God is unveiling his plans for the future of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, his son, and for the people that he will redeem through Jesus Christ and whom he will call to be his own people. There are other apocalyptic books uh, in the Old Testament. The latter part of the book of Daniel is that type of book. It's also parts of prophecies like Ezekiel and Zechariah. But they have this in common with Revelation. You cannot read them just as you might read, say, one of the historical books of the Bible, like Genesis or Joshua or Kings or, or the Gospels or, or Acts. Those books relate historical facts. And the general rule you apply when you're interpreting them is that you read them and you take them literally unless there's a very good reason not to do so. Uh, for example, this is not a good example perhaps, but if Jesus tells a parable, he may be relating a story that actually did happen or using it as an illustration, but Jesus maybe was making up a story just to convey a point. A sower went out to sow seed, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he, he fell among thieves. He may not be relating something that actually happened. It's an illustration. But normally the, the point is you read the, the, the historical literature of the Bible and you say that's literally exactly what happened. However, when reading apocalyptic literature with its unusual visions and symbolism, as in the case of Revelation, uh, you find there the use of particular numbers and, uh, and, and so on and uh, 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 and strange visions appearing here and there, the opening of seals, the sounding of trumpets and so on. And the rule pretty much works the opposite way round. In apocalyptic literature, you should assume that a vision is symbolical, unless there's a reason to believe that it is not, and you should read it literally. Now that doesn't mean that Revelation is in any sense untrue, or that it is fictional, not at all, not for one moment. It is God's true, infallible, inerrant word. And it doesn't mean that the book doesn't speak into real life situations. It does. It most definitely does. 
But when it uses picture language, we need to discern what the picture is conveying to us. So we have a good example here, for example, in chapter 1, uh, verses 12 to 16. We didn't read these verses earlier, but John there receives a vision of Jesus. Now, here's a question. What did Jesus look like in reality? Now, you might have a, a Bible home, particularly if it's an illustrated children's Bible, and you've seen the picture, you know, of this guy with maybe long flowing hair and a beard and, and a very pleasant face and the children gathered around him. Did he look like that? We don't actually know. No one has a photograph of him. He probably looked actually like a typical Middle Eastern Jew and maybe not someone who was particularly remarkable in his appearance. But here in Revelation 1, it's a little bit different. Here's the description of Jesus. We're told he appeared as one like the Son of Man, clothed in a long robe, a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters, and so on. Why is that a very different picture of Jesus than we might have imagined from the one in the little illustrated Bible? Well, because this picture of Jesus in Revelation 1 is wanting to portray truths about Jesus as the Son of God and the Son of Man that tell us something about his power, his authority, his wisdom and his knowledge. So we don't just get a, a picture of a, an unremarkable Middle Eastern man, but someone who appears with these uh, eyes like flames of fire and hair like wool and feet like burnished bronze and so on. Now we will come to that uh, in the, the third of our studies in Revelation. But for now we simply note this, that a, this apocalyptic prophecy of Revelation will speak to us in visions but definitely not visions that are unfathomable, that we can't understand. There is a key to understanding Revelation, and actually so often the key is to have a knowledge of the Old Testament. There are, someone has counted, 404 verses in the book of Revelation, and it's reckoned that within those 404 verses, there are around 500 allusions to the Old Testament references and so on to the Old Testament. Not necessarily direct quotations, but parallels between what happens in some of the Old Testament prophets and what and, and other Old Testament books and what we, we have here in Revelation. In fact, it's said that of the 39 books of the Old Testament, some 36 of them are alluded to in Revelation. And we'll say more about that when we make our way through the book. But what is the best thing we could take away with us this day as we finish this short introductory message? I think the best thing we can take away is there in verse 3 where it says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. My friends, this is a book designed to bless God's people. Now, if you're a Christian tonight, this is a book designed for your blessing. Not to baffle you, not to confuse you, but to encourage you, to fill you with faith. Not fill you with fear, and to give you hope for the future. It's a prophecy, yes, but it's there not just to foretell the future. But it's there actually like most Old Testament prophecy as a word from God to speak to God's people in the here and now, to challenge them, to strengthen them, sometimes to rebuke their sins, other times to encourage them in their faith. And it's a word to be heard with urgency. It says verse three, because the time is near. The time for what? 
is near. Is it the time for the second coming of Christ? Well, we're not certain on what day or what hour the Lord will come again. So if there is a sense in which it, it may mean that. But actually, more directly, I think it means this. The time is near for Christians to do spiritual battle. And sometimes for Christians to suffer for the sake of Christ their Saviour and for the sake of his gospel. That's why the book of Revelation was so very much needed for the Christians at the end of the first century AD who were beginning to suffer. And Christians have needed this book down through the generations since we in our world today need a book that will encourage us in times of spiritual trial, in times when we must do battle against the powers of darkness, in times we must have our faith strengthened when it's about to falter, in times when we must have our hope in Christ confirmed when the devil wants to shake us and to put us down. That's why God has given us this book. That's why this book, if we read it and understand it and believe it, will prove over and over and over again to be a very great blessing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that for your people of old who were struggling and facing many a trial, you had in mind the means to encourage them, to give them fresh revelation from your word, to let them see your great sovereignty as their God and the, the great love of Christ their Saviour for them and the way that he would in all things be triumphant and be the one who in the end of the day would triumph over the powers of darkness and would win the victory for his people. Lord, help us too as we read this book and as we begin to work our way through it to find encouragement time and time again, to have faith and not fear, to be ready to press on in the cause of Christ and his gospel and not to turn back and not to give up, to be people who will stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, wearing the armour of God and feeding upon the precious truth of your word over and over again. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you for spending time with us in the scriptures tonight and we trust as we work through this book of Revelation you will continually find it a source of encouragement. God bless.